I'm going to ultra learn 12 new skills in 2024, one per month. Now, ultra learning is a word uh, that is the title of Scott Young's book, and it is defined as a strategy for acquiring skills and knowledge in a self-directed and intense fashion with extra emphasis on the intense part. Almost all the work that I've put into designing a skillathon 2224 comes either directly from Scott Young's book, his blog posts, or one of his online courses. I've attempted ultra learning projects in the past, but they always kind of fizzled. I let life get in the way and something came up and they just kind of drifted off. I never really pulled off a structured, intentional ultra learning project. For Skillathon 2024, I have cranked the commitment level up to 11 and I'm doing it publicly. I'm sharing videos about it. So it's kind of going to be impossible for me to quit and fizzle based on the level of accountability and stoke and other things that I've invested into it. So in this video, I wanna explain the concepts from Scott Young's work that I've incorporated into my approach here. Uh, I'm not being exhaustive about all the stuff that he's talked about. He talks about a lot. I'm kind of cherry picking kind of the most interesting ones, the most important ones that I think for what I'm doing uh, in this year. So principle number one is draw a map. You've got to understand what it is that you're trying to learn. Go find how other people learn it, find how it's normally taught, find how people normally uh, learn it and how people abnormally learn it. Uh, look for outliers, people who've learned it quickly and see what they're doing differently than normal people. Uh, one of my favorite sayings from Derek Sivers is uh, the, the standard pace is for chumps. So keep that in mind as you're drawing your map. Second, and this is kind of both uh, work to do before you do ultra learning and uh, practice while you're doing it is to sharpen your knife. And when it comes to learning, your knife is your ability to concentrate, your ability to focus. So for me, I practice digital minimalism. I don't carry my phone around with me. I don't doom scroll. I'm very careful about what kinds of media I consume. I could be better and I will be uh, paying a lot of attention to my digital minimalism uh, over this year because it's gonna it's one of the keys to succeeding at ultra learning. Um, so pay attention to your tools and your tools is in between your ears when it comes to ultra learning. Uh, Cal Newport is huge in this. I can't recommend enough his books, Deep Work, So Good They Can't Ignore You, Digital Minimalism. His podcast is pure gold. If you're not re listening to his podcast, you're messing up. Okay, the core principle for ultra learning projects to me is directness, which is go straight ahead, which is learn by doing the thing. <laughs> the best way to get good at something is to do it a lot. Now, this sounds very simple, but it's something that a lot of people, I think, don't do. Um, Many people, including me, complain about not being good at stuff. But then when you look at what I've done, it's like I've made a couple of half-assed attempts at the thing and I haven't actually tried trying. Hat tip to Noz Allen for that one, what I call the Noah principle. Always ask if you're not winning at something, have you tried trying? Like so many things, it's about reps. Get in your reps. Everything that I can think of that I ever got good at I did a lot, like thousands and thousands and thousands of hours behind every single thing in life that I'm good at. I'm not actually good at anything except maybe grinding. Um, so there's, there's just no getting around it. You have to do things a lot. Now, of course, if you practice doing the thing wrong, you're going to get better at doing it wrong. So you have, you can't just wildly do it. Anyways, Cal Newport's work on uh, deliberate practice and the actual uh, literature on digital practice gets into that quite a lot. But big idea here, directness, go straight ahead, do the thing, do it a lot. Now a related principle here that I dug into yesterday reading some of Scott's stuff has to do with self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is the belief in our ability to succeed at a given action. Self-efficacy is not uh, confidence. It is not your perception of yourself. Self-efficacy is not self-esteem. It is the belief in our ability to succeed at a given action, and it is a crucial component in our ability to successfully pull off tasks that we want to do. If we don't honestly believe in our ability to succeed at a given task, I mean, <laughs> this is one of the keys, I think, to why so many people's projects, speaking from experience here, get self-sabotages because some part of me didn't actually believe that I could do it. So understanding self-efficacy is really critical here. Self-efficacy is primarily built 
through observation and experience. So observation, that means watching other people do the task. This has to do, I think, with, uh, with a form of learning. Like you can say, oh, this is how they move their hands or whatever. But I think it's also just like, it is easier to visualize yourself doing something if you can see someone else doing it. Like if I watch someone on YouTube, I don't know, staff spinning, let's say, I recognize that it's hard and it's gonna take some effort, but watching someone go from fumbling and hitting themselves in the head with a stick to being able to staff spin, I'm like, oh, yeah, if that guy can do it, I can do it. I just have to put the time in. So I've built self-efficacy purely by observation. Now, the other aspect of self-efficacy is experience, which is basically gathering uh, data, gathering experience from our own lives that we've done the thing before. So if you do something similar, or if you've done something, you've done the thing, but maybe not at quite the level that you're about to, that is all experience that makes you believe like, oh yeah, I'm sure I can do that. That's only a little bit more challenging than what I've already done. So I've got this. So a core practice of mastery, I think, is to study others and then stack wins. This is something else that Scott talks about a lot, particularly on his blog. You can set up a, a, a success spiral or a failure spiral. So if you have a win that builds your self-efficacy, right? And uh, you'll be more likely to win at the next thing you do. And you can keep going round and round and you get better and better and better. And all of a sudden you're doing really incredible things. This is the basic idea behind uh, my thoughts on the hyper-competence loop, um, which I have a podcast episode. But it works in the other direction. If you lose, that makes it harder to win because you've got evidence that you can't do a certain thing. And so you're less likely to win. If you try the thing again, you'll lose again and you can get in a downward spiraling loop. You can get into a failure downward spiral, which is very bad. So this is one reason why it's important to win so that you can win more, so that you can build on your success. So uh, the takeaway here is that, uh, you know, first study others, build self-efficacy, design what you're doing with this win loop in mind. It is more important to start small with something that you're like, oh, I can do that. I can win at that. I can pull that off, pull it off. Boom, you've got data. Now try something that's a little bit more difficult, but you've already built some self-efficacy and then win at that, win at that, win at that, set up a win loop. I think, I really, I don't know. I, I really like this idea of win loops. Losing is inevitable. So losing well is also really critical. Now I've just said winning is important. If you obsess over the idea that winning is important, then it'd be really easy to have a loss and really beat yourself up about it. Oh my God, I just lost. This is terrible. Wrong. Don't do that because that's just like concreting that loss in and that's setting you up for the, for the lose spiral. It, it's important not to lose. But the trick here is that if you, if you take too seriously the idea that it's important to not lose, then when you do lose, because losing is inevitable, you can get really, you can beat yourself up about it. And that is the exact wrong thing to do. What you want to do when you lose is get back up as quickly as possible and get a win in. So losing well is extremely important because nothing can derail a win loop like losing poorly. And I, I think of losing poorly as letting it get to you, ruminating on it, and just really letting your identity soak into that experience of losing. So one of the things that I like about the idea of redefining losing as an educational success is that if you can make yourself not feel like it was a loss, you can perhaps preserve some of your self-efficacy. Now you've got to get careful about being realistic about what's going on and where you are and not being narcissistic about things. I, I think that it's really important if you lose, get back up and get at it as quickly as possible. Scale back, get something that you know you can win, lock in a win lock it in again, do something just a little bit harder, lock that in, get that win loop going again. That is the most important thing for long-term success at this. Okay, another principle is feedback. Feedback is super important. Otherwise, it's easy to lie to ourselves about how good we are at stuff where we actually are. You know, in my case, it's actually very difficult for me to tell if the food that I'm cooking, for example, tastes good. Uh, if my taste buds were my eyes, they wouldn't let me drive. Um, so it's going to be important for me to cook for other people that I trust to give me honest feedback about what things taste like. Then there's a few other principles that I kind of combine together 
into the praxis of how to do work on skills, which is drill weak points, try to explain the thing to see if you really understand it, right? Like teaching a skill is one of the best ways to learn the skill. So I'm going to be trying to do that. I'm going to be trying to explain what I'm learning to you, to others as much as I can. Try to understand the why of the thing and not merely memorize procedures. I do this naturally because I have a terrible memory. So I have to try to understand the system, the model of how the thing works. So I think I'll probably be pretty good at that, but that is to like build intuition. Um, and then finally experiment and play with the thing. And that also generates a lot of information and, and learning for the skill. So with all that in mind, my basic approach to designing each month is to define and map the skill, um, observe and study successful others who already do the skill, then just do the thing as quickly as possible. Start doing the thing. Like it is very important, I think, to not get lost in the books and just study and read the theory about things uh, and not get in there with your hands or whatever the practice is. You need to get there and do the thing that you want to be good at. Uh, Scott Young talks a lot about testing early and often. I think for his MIT challenge, he would take the tests before he even started studying because that sort of like that's another way of building the map for the skill that you need to learn is to take the test. Now, nothing I'm doing. Uh, nothing that I'm planning on doing really has a test. Um, the closest thing to a test is just doing the thing. So again, that, that directness principle is extremely important, I think. But as I'm doing the thing, I will note the struggle points that I have. I'll drill those. So I'll decompose the skill if I can. Uh, then you recompose it, do the thing again, try to do it for others, get outside feedback. The more brutal, the better. I'll explain the thing as often as possible, and then I'll experiment and play with it. And of course, I'm going to document everything. A big part of why I'm making these videos, well, there's two reasons I'm making these videos. Making these videos and documenting what I'm doing and telling you about it is the hidden 13th skill that I'm working on this year. I want to get better at video. I want to get better at communicating on storytelling online. And so I think I'm not doing a good job with these videos, but I'm at the very beginning here and I'm going to be making them every single week, if not more often for an entire year. So I'm going to be doing the thing at some point I'm going to incorporate in um, studying some of the principles of how to do uh, do it better. The other reason for doing this publicly is that it's accountability. I am going to feel so horrible about myself if I fail at this and just kind of like fizzle out and quit because I've already told the the world that I'm doing this, uh, even if, you know, only 13 people actually pay any attention, um, that that's another way of locking it in for me. So I'm, I've, I'm kind of locking myself in by publishing these videos. Okay. So there's more that went into my skills and design, but those are the biggies that I wanted to share, um, from Scott Young's work. I think they're really powerful concepts that once you get your head wrapped around them, uh, you can start to design really interesting learning projects. Now, of course, this is my first real ultra learning projects. My previous ultra learning projects were failures. So I'm really curious to see what I think of like this video in a year's time after I've got a full year under my belt of ultra learning. Like, what am I missing right now? What do I think it's, what do I think is important now? But turns out it's actually kind of a waste of time. How will my approach change? You know, will I become more or less structured in my approach? I can't wait to find out. And that's, kind of the whole point of this project. I've got to go plan my first week of cooking. So thank you for watching and we'll talk later.